Welcome, everyone. I'm Debbie DiGirolamo. I'm reader in law here at the law school um, at the Center for Commercial Law Studies. I'm also the center's uh, director of our art business and law postgraduate program. I'm very uh, happy to welcome everyone here tonight uh, for the third in our artist talk series. Welcome to everyone uh, who is online as well. This series was developed in response to our ABL program, uh, which is run jointly by CCLS, the Center for Commercial Law Studies, and the Institute of Art and Law, where um, we explore the intersections between art and law, art and business, art and society. With our Artist Talk series, we bring focus to the artist, this series is an exciting one for us, and we are very, very grateful to Mary Reingold for its creation. She came up with the idea, she uh, developed it, and she is the series curator. We're also very grateful to Lucia Pietrojusti, head of ecologies at the Serpentine Gallery, for participating in the series today. We're very excited to hear about your work. And before turning the mic over to Mary, I would like to introduce Mary Reinwald to you. She in turn will introduce Lucia. Mary is an art expert, art critic, writer, and art law consultant. She is the perfect person as you will hear and see to be our series curator and interviewer. Mary has been an active force in the art world, working nonstop in it since her undergraduate art history degree at Seattle University. Among other roles, uh, she was art provenance and auction specialist for old masters through contemporary artworks at Artnet for a number of years, which included establishing and managing a team of provenance researchers as Artnet's co-director of comparable reports for Artnet, Artnet's long running data partnership with Sotheby's. She has written for numerous art publications, including Art Forum, Art in America, and Flash Art. She writes fiction and nonfiction, often in collaboration with artists. She critiques art and art experiences, and she is a creative force in developing art platforms, such as Kunstwerk in New York, as co-founder and co-director. And she also co-founded Goldsmith's Art Writing Library, while completing her master's in fine arts at Goldsmith. With her graduation from our art business and law program in 2021, where she was the Norman Palmer Scholarship Award recipient, and where not surprisingly, she excelled as our student, Mary now finds herself um, in both the legal world and the art world as a consultant with Canvas Art Law, where she is continuing to work with artists while navigating legal issues. Over to you, Mary, and welcome everyone. Thanks so much, Debbie, for that introduction and for making this series possible through the Art Business and Law Program. Um, thanks also to Queen Mary, to Emily, uh, to Miriam and to Alex, and to Florence, Kay, and Janon for everything that you've done to make tonight possible. Um, and Lucha, thank you so much for being here. We're really honored that you're here this evening. Um, before we get started, a little bit of background about how we want these artist talks to work with students and general public. Um, we conceived of this as a discussion forum first for the students at the ABL program because we felt that it was important for legal advocates to really understand how artists and curators and creative people work. Um, sometimes the image is one of only a certain type of very commodified artist, and I really wanted to make sure that there were different types of practices represented, particularly immaterial practices, because that is trickier to navigate legally, and it feels really important that um, students, especially art law students, are able to start to understand how artists work in this way. Um, the way that I've done this normally is because I like writing for magazines and so it's like a magazine interview and it feels you know like a discussion um, 
And this particular series, we're really lucky. We're bookending a series on ecology, art, and law that we started last year with Haley Mellon, who also has worked with GCC. And we're so lucky that we get to have um, Lucha here tonight because this is helping the students and also public to understand that this is a really important part of our society, I think first and foremost, but also about the evolving conversations around the environmental emergency and also around um, how this type of art is being made in museums and in other contexts and for legal students to understand. Um, so I'd really like to do a small introduction of Lucha. It's pretty hard to do a small introduction because <laughs> what Lucha has done is nothing less than really extraordinary. She has really led a movement of, and been at the forefront of creating space for artists to move in the realm of art and ecology. And I would feel that it's accurate to say that she's really caused a sea change in how I really do think and how, um, and how artists are seeing where they can work and how they can work um, and how the public is understanding the importance of these types of works and that works don't have to happen in the museum. You, there's many curators who work that way, but the way that Lucha has done it outside is very new to me. And it's something that I really appreciate. Um, in 2018, Lucha founded General Ecology at Serpentine. It's one of the first departments at an art institution that's devoted to researching the environment and ecology. From 2020 to 22, uh, Lucha co-curated Back to Earth, the Serpentine's long-term inter interdisciplinary program addressing the on ongoing climate emergency. Um, really exciting is that this has developed into the Infinite Ecologies Marathon. The prelude happened this last October during freeze, um, and the festival will be this coming July in 2024. I will definitely be there. I think there's gonna be a lot of really exciting um, speakers and things happening. Um, parallel to Leach's work at the Serpentine, um, she co-curated the mind-blowing opera performance Sun and Sea Marina by Rugil Bars de Zuskite, I'm really sorry, Viva Granit and Lina Lapelit for the Lithuanian Pavilion at the 2019 Venice Biennale, which won the Golden Lion that year and was followed by an internationally acclaimed tour. It was amazing. That keeps going. That's, that's continuing. <laughs> um, to call it an opera performance, I think is accurate, but it's a whole other experience as well. And I was one of the really lucky people that got to see that in 2019. It blew my mind. Um, Lucha also co-curated uh, the 2022 Biennial Gardenia um, called Persona in Persons, which is very good with titles, by the way. I love them. Um, she co-curated the 13th Shanghai Biennial entitled Bodies of Water. Uh, she curated Being Mothers for Power Nights at Everk Luckenwald. She co-curated songs for the changing seasons at the upcoming 2024 Vienna Climate Biennial alongside Philippa Ramos. And Lucha has co-edited, edited, and written for multiple publications, far too numerous to name here, with highlights including Sun and Sea Marina, Plant Sex as part of the Mall Journal, More Than Human, and the forthcoming reader, The Shape of Circle and the Mind of a Fish. Crucially for tonight, um, Lucha also heads a graduate module at the Interior Architecture MA at the Head in Geneva entire, entitled Interior Ecologies. And finally, Lucha is a trustee at the Gallery Climate Coalition. So there's a lot to talk about tonight. Obviously, Lucha is a very impressive person, but what has always made me really excited about Lucha as a curator is how she is as a person. Um, I feel like to see one of Lucha's shows and have a conversation with her is almost a similar movement. It really, I find so much, I get so much from it. And um, through Lucha, I got to first experience um, what she can do with artists with Walking Backwards by Alex Cicchetti at the Middleton House in Enfield, just north of London. Here, Lucha and Alex set up this incredible experience where Alex took viewers to me, it felt like backwards to the experience of being born, really. And it was outside. And I had the feeling, the manifest that we are really the same as grass and leaves and trees. And the way that he had us at the end looking at the sky and having the experience of being a baby was really incredible. And um, 
I really started to understand what was possible when we started seeing different places that we can work. This is something we talk about in art all the time, but to really experience it on that level and something so fundamental really um, was changing. Um, after that, uh, Lucha and I were able to reconnect when I was actually writing my dissertation for the LLM here about art, ecology, and law. And it turned out Lucha and I actually have some converging interests in the way that law converses with art and ecology. And from then on, when Debbie and I started talking about this artist talk series, I knew that Lucha had to be one of the people who came here to talk to you. Um, so to kick things off, um, it seems like there's two developing addresses for ecology and sustainability, if we're going to call it that, um, as it moves in art and where the field of law may support these activities. On the one hand, there's the mode of practice which engages with nature and ecological subjects. These could be 19th century drawings of botanical subjects to 1970s land art all the way through to the present day with artists Lucha has worked with like Alex Cicchetti, Claire Filmon, and Adriana Busta, among many, many others. On the other hand, there is an urgent discussion of the intersection of art with the environmental emergency and how artists can and are leading as both visionaries and through modeling of behaviors, such as the famous example of Tino Segal and then taking trains um, rather than flying. Um, Lucha has been a leader in this field, initiating and co-organizing important exhibitions, symposium, festivals, both internationally and at the Serpentine, where it seems that practical solutions um, are being proposed for institutions to make or draw down emissions and become more sustainable. Um, the debates that you've held have been among the first that were happening, and this is something that's now proliferating, but you were really at the forefront of this. Both of these modes of address um, in both ecological art and artist-led solutions to the climate emergency intersect with the law in key ways that we can probably think of. For example, lawyers can support ecological art um, that takes an immaterial form through both the institutional side with policies and frameworks through to the commercial side through contracts and informed advocacy that makes room for this type of work because it just hasn't existed in legislation, in policies, or in contracts before. And this is something that I think we need more legal experts who are able to understand this type of work and work this way. In terms of sustainability, the law can play an enormous part practically, which is already happening through sustainability provisions and contracts, particularly at museums, and through advocacy, particularly relevant to notions of ecocide which Lucha so brilliantly ensured was included on the agenda for the Infinite Ecologies Prelude in October. Um, this talk all right, will narrow in on these practicalities. Um, but before getting into that discussion, I'd like to back up and hear from Lucha um, how you came to work in, at the intersection of art, ecology, and systems. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. It's a blustery, wet, cold night, and I appreciate I, that you did the same uh, travel through that blustery, cold night that I did. And Mary, thank you so much, so much for inviting me. It's such a joy to just have this recurring conversation with you over the years. And um, and I promise that's not the bio that I sent Mary to read. <laughs> that was just an incredibly generous presentation, um, uh, you know, that doesn't happen so often so it's lovely to just start um with that but thank you um so the um, there's a lot of different ways of answering that question um so i'll just choose one in 2014 uh i was a live and public programs curator at the serpentine and the thing about serpentine which is to put it in context a not-for-profit art organization it's called gallery but it's not a commercial gallery the reason why it's uh, called galleries that we don't have a collection, which means also that it that Serpentine can be particularly um, experimental in terms of the kind of work that it chooses to support, the, the ways in which it chooses to do so, because it doesn't have a responsibility towards conserving, displaying, and researching its collection. That also lends itself to having research strands. But before all of this was happening, um, the live and public programs uh, team was only one piece of a larger kind of infrastructural piece of the gallery, 
which oftentimes in other museums is called the education department. But what it meant, for, what it was for us, we had education colleagues that worked with uh, families and uh, children and young people. We had colleagues that worked specifically on social justice and, uh, and sort of community led or community driven projects. Um, and then we had live and public programs, which therefore, as a result of this kind of large uh, representation of uh, the what's known as uh, education in other in other museums, of all of that, as a result of it, uh, we had an enormous amount of freedom to uh, work across and at the intersection of different disciplines. Um, so public programs and live programs, when I inherited it as a department in 2013 was uh, a, a, a way of holding interdisciplinary time-based stuff. And that was discursive, film, music, all of it. And because it was interdisciplinary, it had this fantastic potential of, or at least the way that I took it, because I have a background in literature and in critical theory and gender studies. So it's quite, it's, it's a background that's sort of humanism in general, I think, uh, and therefore sort of wonderfully non-specific and um and so the way i took it was i interpreted it as an opportunity to be able to gather and convene disciplines together to really sort of sense into what the um space between specialisms and disciplines is what the feelings of the day of of today are what are the commonalities the perhaps sort of unconscious or unspoken commonalities or synchronicities or attunements that are emerging and existing between um, between things. Now, most industries and sectors don't have the luxury of going, we'll just dedicate a huge amount of our budget and time to convening, convenings between ourselves and other disciplines. I mean, there are some and they're emerging as clearly important, especially in planetary and environmental action. Um, say, for instance, I've been to amazing conferences between climate scientists and environmental litigators, for example. But those spaces are few and far between still because of the just business model of so many of these industries. So to make a long story short, there was already a precedent for being very invested in the ways that disciplines speak to one another. And uh, and then in 2014, we uh, we have this sort of ongoing festival uh, that you've mentioned called the Marathon. It's an interdisciplinary festival. Every year it's about a subject, Matt. It was. Um, and we curated one with an artist, an amazing artist now deceased called Gustav Metzger, who had for decades been dedicated to sort of struggling and putting his art at the service of fighting the extinction of species. Um, and together with him, we decided to curate a marathon festival that was dedicated to the subject of extinction. Now we took it a little bit wider. And I, I, I sort of, I'm very devoted to creating events and situations and potential potential sort of situations that bring both the, the sort of material and the metaphorical, the abstract and the concrete um, aspects of a term or a word or an idea. So we extended that notion of extinction to really think about um, customs, languages, speakings, modes of life, um, you know, more than human beings, uh, environments and so on. And so that, and that festival really stayed with me. I mean, it literally stayed with me in the sense that one of the performers, one of the artists proposed to make a performance where they, um, tattooed someone and then said, Lucia, I want you to be the person who gets it. So I literally have a tattoo from that event. <laughs> and that artist just won the Turner Prize. So I literally have a tattoo, oh, a yes. Turner tattoo on me. <laughs> it's Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> but so, so it's literally stayed with me, but it also stayed with me in a sort of purpose sense. Um, I remember saying, proposing to our director that if we were going to do the marathon festival again, we should keep the subject matter extinction forever. So sort of from now on, it's not a marathon about something, it's the extinction marathon every year. Now he laughed at the beginning. And fast forward four years, I went off on maternity leave, I came back. Maternity leave was a very complicated situation for me. I didn't particularly enjoy it. 
this more than human little being with no language taught me a lot of things, but mostly through the unpleasant experience of having to, you know, of sort of the shock of it all. And, but taught me things around, you know, extending the notion of your sort of time, the, extending the scale of time by just like a few decades longer than one's own predicted life. And therefore the ethical possibilities that are invested in that kind of scale change, which I think is something really important when we look at future generation, the rights of future generations, for instance. And I didn't interpret it as like, what kind of world am I leaving to my child? Because I'm aware that this is a very sort of um, privileged po position to enter into an ecological kind of framework from. There were other things like the fact that empathy, understanding, communication, sort of depth of relationship could be achieved without and before language. Mm -hmm. And therefore that opened up, for me, it was all about opening up the possibility, the speculative possibility to then relate to more than human beings, to like a plant mm -hmm. in the same way um, and so forth. And so I started to write, sorry, this is a very long answer, but I, I'll make the next ones shorter. But I started to write a project for the Serpentine. I called it General Ecology. The aim was to generalize ecological principles. So to th also draw a little bit from the legacy of cybernetics and systems thinking in order to sort of embed the organization with uh, ecological methods, methodologies, senses of purpose and commitment. And to do so at all the levels of the organization. So programming, yes, but also networks, infrastructures and buildings and so forth. And to, talk, and to sort of relate to the subject of ecology in general. So not be specific. Okay, so we're going to be the organization that looks at artists and pollution or artists and what have you. But to really think about the vastest possible range of subject matters in order to create also a department, a sort of dedicated research-driven artist-led department that would have the agency within the organization to just do this forever, potentially. Mm -hmm. Um, it's got to do with, it's like, I didn't want it to be a monoculture yeah. to make it more resilient. I mean, it's yeah. all of it is environmentally, is biomor biophilic, biomorphic and environmentally inspired. Except for the fact that general ecology, so general ecology did a bunch of things, lots of programs, worked very hard to develop a community of audience um, around the subject. And I always say that that community of audience mirrored back at the Serpentine an image of itself as an institution that has something to say and do vis-a-vis -vis the environment. And once you have that mirror, then you have to live up to it. And so it also created internal le levers and pressures, pressure points to be able to then carry the work forward. That wasn't entirely possible. The, all the kind of infrastructural pieces, the sort of organizational transformation pieces, were very hard to do from a curator's position, just because of a question of mandate and agency. And so what I proposed then in 2022, which brings us to the present, was to create an, an, a role, which I wrote again for myself, from curator of general ecology, which was the new role, to head of ecology is plural, which is this role. That role, for a very specific reason to do with strategy and with agency and mandate, sits on senior management and therefore finally has the mandate to synchronize and organize all of the different ways that we interact and intersect with essentially the fact that we sit on the planet, yeah. which is how I interpret being ecological is just being aware and making oneself aware that we sit on this planet at any given moment and in any given in, you know, project or, or industry and then doing something about it. Yeah. That is really, really fascinating. I think that um, something that resonated with me, um, probably before I, I knew you for sure, because I think we met in 2016 um, for Celia's performance. Um, but at some point I saw an interview with you and you had said that you had had an awakening about non, I don't, I don't think you used a word like awakening, but something like that about um, nonverbal communication. And having been through a similar transformation, um, having a child, but I think that this can happen to people if they go into a situation of care with relatives or any kind of a situation where you tap into something outside of what my daily life had been for like a really long time of just working and doing things and 
when that shifts for whatever reason, there is something that happens that I really understood about understanding different ways of communication that are nonverbal. And you do, I mean, I really understand that this, um, not gonna say that I talk to plants, but like I might, you know, and that that would be fine. And that this is something that really shifts and who, however that comes to a person's life. And I think that um, the way you talk about sitting on the planet is for me, uh, something that I really understand. It really resonates with me that we find all of these terms and we'll get more into that. But at the end of the day, it's about, we are sitting on this planet and we share it. And um, my day-to-day -day life had to change and which was wonderful, very hard, but and actually excruciating at times, but, um, but it had to change. And I think that it's a big ask to say everybody has to change in this way, but I think to say that we do sit on this planet and that there's more here than just this daily rhythm that we all get really used to and that there's different ways of relating and different ways of understanding is something that you've opened up a general apologies, which I really appreciate. Um, I think that you've also hit on something that I've seen in your work, um, which is healing. There seems to be a lot around, okay, this environmental emergency is upon us, this is happening, but how are we healing? And there's so many different reasons that we're here. And these relate, I think, quite a bit to an area that you have been working in as well um, around climate justice. And you know there is healing implied in the word justice that we're going to have a reckoning, there's going to be honesty, but there's something more that I see in what you've been creating, which is, yes, this is going, there, there needs to be a reckoning. Yes, this is the reality. Yes, we are on this planet. And how are we going to move forward in a way that, um, that we can relate to each other and it might not necessarily be using words and using the modes of moving forward that we have done in the past. And um, I think that in talking about climate justice, um, especially for this audience, it might make sense to talk a little bit about where that term comes from, how it's developing um, and a little bit about the contradiction that was within that term, um, because the term con conservation, I think, can sometimes be situated, at least for me, in the realm of those who can afford conservation. Um, there's in your um, in your reader plant sex, um, Daily Daisy Lafarge, really brilliantly talks about. Um, a quote from a, a writer in America who I like, Uncle Poland, who talks about um, flowers are for people who have worked everything else out in their life. And I think that that's not the exact quote. He would say it much more eloquently. But um, I really have always seen conservation in that way. And I think we talked about that a little bit, that this has been something for classes who can afford. And climate justice is really hard. And I think that it, for this reason, and it actually shares quite a lot with what people are studying here around um, repatriation, which is a word that we'll get into a bit later, but and um, heritage, because there's so many questions about, you know, when you start to deal with these subjects um, from an activist perspective, one might say, well, how important really is ecology and how important really is arts and culture and heritage when people need hospitals, people need roads, people need schools. Um, and so for this reason, I think climate justice has been a term that I find to be really important because actually ecology has an enormous effect on all of us. And as we are starting to become more aware, there are many of us who do not have the privilege to live with clean air or clean water um, or clean ground. And that this affects what we eat, what we breathe. And um, to say climate justice is something that is really important for that reason, and I think relocates the conversation from the traditional terms of, um, uh, or relocates the conversation from the traditional conservation. I think that particularly the way you're working, Lucia, by always working with artists and really leading with artists, um, 
in this really elegant way kind of continues to lead that conversation. For example, I wrote, or I read something that you wrote recently about this amazing artist who I didn't know of, Patricia Dominguez and notions of decolonial botany. And I might ask you a little bit about that just because I think that the audience would love to hear about it, but I see this as a way that you are really subtly through artists showing us what climate justice can look like. Brought up so many um, uh, beautiful and incredibly important points. So, I mean, I suppose just as an overall, just to define the term from the perspective of where I sit in terms of the work that I do, um, I guess I would relate to environmental justice from the standpoint that a lot of the, uh, well, first of all, it's a question of distribution, the effects and the causes of uh, environmental breakdown are unequally distributed, um, both of them, and um, proportionally opposite to each other. So most like, I mean, this is broad, very broad strokes. The more responsible a nation or group even within a city, one is for pollution and carbon emissions, probably the least likely one is to be sitting right at the front lines of climate breakdown or for that or for that climate breakdown to be an existential threat. Um, there are a, a whole host of uh, kind of research driven facts, I suppose, that environmental justice acknowledges, which is that far beyond the unequal distribution of cause and effect of climate breakdown, that distribution and most of the environmental, social, and sort of broadly speaking ecological, ecological understood as social ecology and environmental ecology, most of the inequities that exist on this planet are built on top of inequities that were sort of structured by colonial empires. You know, th there are uh, cases that are too egregious as to even merit cite citing here, but that 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 the that the legacy of empire continues not just in ideology but continues to this day financially, economically, environmentally, and so on. And so, environmental justice tries to not to mention the fact that now the statistics actually escape me, and it, I do want to do a piece of research a little bit more precisely about this. But the number of conflicts which are um, attributed to one reason or another, but that if you look at the source, the historical sort of relationship have to do with access to resources, the soaring price of bread, the, uh, the so, sort of the depletion of um, access to water and so forth. And so, so the number of, so the, there's a, you know, language is very pol politicized and political and, and there's, you know, there's, there's climate refugees and then there's economic migrants and then there's uh, sort of conflict refuge and all of those things are not understood as intersecting and actually entangled with one another. Um, and I think that's really, it, it, it sort of serves the purpose of a kind of spin that a lot of um, nations and national governments are sort of putting on things. For instance, the UK government is brilliant at not acknowledging their own responsibility and quite a lot of the horrible things that are happening right now. Um, so, so environmental justice tries to take a view, tries to take the view that, that there is no, well, one more tiny piece of the puzzle uh, for me is, is that, that the, as you say, the conservation of biodiversity and let's say traditional ecological movement emerging from non frontline spaces, because it's not the only one, but has gone wrong quite a few times in um, prioritizing, let's say, something like biodiversity over the well being of those communities that very often actually looked after that biodiversity. And so the history of how national parks in the US have an enormous entanglement with displacing indigenous and First Nation communities in the US, and, 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 how the displacement of peoples from islands and, you know, from particular island communities was uh, sort of spun or set as a marine ecosystem restoration project and, and, and it keeps going, it keeps going. If you read Philippe Sands, he is an amazing person to tell the stories of um, 
of Chagos actually, which is the case that I'm referring to now, which many, many international NGOs celebrated as a great achievement in marine conservation. Given all of that, how does one repair that historically broken relationship between social justice movements, anti-racism, decolonization, and environmental uh, consciousness? Not repair it from an, an, in any kind of top-down way, not repair it in for any kind of um, instrumentalizing sense, but what are the points that, I mean, for me right now, particularly in a moment of extreme polarization, how is, how do sort of spaces, how do we weave literally person to person spaces of solidarity, spaces of encounter, spaces of, you know, in, in which things are bearable. Um, and for me, the environmental justice space is very much that. I'm a, I would say a guest in the environmental justice space in the sense that I do not personally live the worst effects of climate breakdown. There, I'm not talking about, I mean, I am talking about lithium mining in the north of Chile, but I am also talking about Lewisham, where the distribution of pollution is incredibly unequal and completely along uh, race lines. So I'm a guest in that space and just as a, a student really of, of that. But what I feel I can contribute in that space is working with artists who are invested in that, uh, in in that framework and who are who sort of conceive of the environmental space through that framework not necessarily everyone that i work with but but it's an increasingly it's an emerging movement and you you even see it at cop 27 and 28 i mean these things are were really not and neither was culture by the way on the agenda for cop until about two years ago mm -hmm. and now are and so Oftentimes, artists as canaries in the coal mine, um, metaphorically speaking, uh, do start to sort of sense into what's coming. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I love doing the work that I do is that I end up sort of being there with, you know, antennas trying to sense into what what you know what's what's likely to be mm -hmm. to be to be coming. Yeah, I think that. That is something that we've really seen with artists leading. You talked about Gustav Metzger and he's been talking about extinction for a very long time. And it was not something that people really were thinking about. And they, I think particularly with Gustav, they think, oh, there's the acid painting guy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> talking about extinction and thinking that it had something to do with that. And it does, but he's one of the artists that saw this coming and was using the correct word asking, do we want to be extinct? Is this really what we want? And um, I think there are so many artists who have been asking this question. And um, I really see that in your work that you continue to be artist-led and continue to make space for the artist to continue to ask those questions. Can I say something about Gustav? Because yeah. I think he really, in a moment like today, he really deserves an enormous amount of honoring. Gustav was arrived in the UK at six years old as one of the orphaned children of the kinder transport. So he was a orphan of the Holocaust. And what that experience, a psychologically traumatizing experience led him into a space of radical peace, radical multi-species universal sense of peace, not a reproduction of the trauma through inflicting trauma, which I think is an incredibly important. Therefore he remains for me an incredibly important figure, not only because as an artist, he was so forward thinking, but because of how, you know, it's almost like a Greek tragedy kind of situation, like what happens when you become the stop point yeah. of the Furies, the Furies run down through the generation and you become the stop point by developing something like radical peace mm -hmm. um, as a principle. I'm not, uh, what's the word, wolf whistling? I'm not trying to say something by saying something else. I'm literally talking about Gustav right now. And I really, um, really, really still appreciate him so much. And he sat for six months in our offices and he was, you know, maybe in his seventies and, but really had the, the, he looked like he could be 275 years old. I mean, he was really just such an incredible character, very, very diminutive, very soft-spoken. And he just sat there until we did the work that he was expecting us to do. He was such an important artist and such an important person. And um, I think, that he, I might have this wrong, but he would probably 
shy away from a lot of conversation here being about him, but it has to be because um, he was so important. Um, I think that you touched on something that I want to bring together because there's a shift in terms happening also in art law that is really interesting, um, that is relevant to, I think, conversations in ecology, which tend to be a bit ahead, if I might say, in terms of shifting terms and the importance of shifting terms. It was climate change not that long ago, and now it's environmental emergency or it's climate emergency, and that's needed. And while shifting terms might be annoying in ways, I think that it's needed for us to understand. And the same thing I'm noticing is happening in museums. For example, there's this artist group called Prapa Now. They're, an ab uh, they're Aboriginal artists from Australia. And in a recent talk at the New School, they were talking about, you know what? We're not decolonizing the museum. We're going to indigenate the museum. And I really love that because it takes the conversation away from the framework, which has been so damaging and so traumatizing. And we say, nope, we're, this is going to be a space of healing. And I really see a connection between that and the kind of work that you've been doing is that we're creating positive spaces of healing. And in order to have that healing, there has to be the honesty and there has to be talking about what has happened. But I think to refocus the words towards the groups of people who have been stolen from for encyclopedic 19th century museums is really, really important. Um, decolonial ecology is obviously something that's been talked about as the title of a book by Malcolm Ferdinand, um, who we talked about. But I recently, and this might be not new news to others, but I recently saw um, that there's been proposals on changing the word repatriation, which is something that we deal with, especially in the LLM course, and not calling it like indigenating the museum, not calling it um, repatriation, but calling it rematriation. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is super interesting and um, it has to do with returns. Um, and it was proposed by a really interesting professor from British Columbia, where it seems like a lot of really interesting professors are coming from these days, um, named Seja Minat, I'm gonna get her name wrong, Seja Minat Nos Tuawit, uh, Seja Dimanak Nox Tuawit, um, or Dr. Amy Parent. And it's in reference to the House of Nishujal Memorial Pole that was rematriated from Scotland to British Columbia. And her proposal is very similar. It's saying, why not reposition this, not just using Western colonial laws, but also using indigenous laws? Because there are indigenous legal frameworks. And I found that through my research for my um, LLM, that this has been a conversation that's already been having in, being had in Australia. And interestingly, a bit more in Canada, the US seems to be behind on these things often, but um, I really like the idea of finding new terms and, um, and finding new ways to move forward. And there, I think that's a way where art law might start, and especially heritage protection, might start to find ways to work more with ecology, because I think, as you said, there's a lot of layers to this, and in many ways, they're really similar conversations. And um, I think to say decolonize is important for us to understand, but at the same time, I'm really interested in how people like Lucha are really moving forward in terms of the healing and working with terms. Thank you, thank you for saying that. You've just linked two things in my head in life that I hadn't really linked before. So I'm currently training to become a death doula. Does everyone know what a doula is? There's yeses and nos. A doula is a companion, non-medical companion that takes you through a particularly important transformation in life. Most doulas, no, not most, but many doulas are birth doulas. So they will accompany the pregnant person and their family um, along the journey from pregnancy to birth giving. There are also death doulas who, as you can probably guess, accompany the dying person and their family through the process of transformation that is death. Now I chose to train as a death, I'm, I'm only on week like eight of a year and a half course. So I'm really not a death doula, but I'm training. The reason why I, and I'm committed. The reason why I've decided to train was, um, was first of all, after reading a, a book that was incredibly important to me called Hospicing Modernity by Vanessa Machado de Oliveira. 
Um, and before I say so too much about that book, because we may end up talking about it in another context, the book is really about palliative care led tools to let go of the damage, well, of modernity as a structure, not only around us, but inside of us with what Vanessa says, humility and grace. And accepting the fact that letting go of it includes letting something inside of us that we hold quite dear die. And she says something beautiful about it. She said, it's so planetary, the whole thinking that she, she says one of the sort of various sort of poetic advice is allow what is agonizing inside of you to die without trying to rescue the old sense, sense of comfort, acknowledge and recognize the fact that the wider metabolism, that is to say the planet, needs the space being cleared by the death of the old in order to strengthen its tether to you so that the planet needs you to let go of those that old familiar sort of sense of attachment in order to strengthen its connections to you. So death, the allowing something to die and the allowing some oneself to die. And I want to caveat this that I'm not at all talking about the incredibly unequal distribution of death. Um, by the necropolitical systems within which we live. That is completely different conversation. Um, is also a return and is also a transformation. And it's also, it's not only the way that sort of the hegemonic Western culture would have it, and particularly Protestant Northern European anyway, um, which is this kind of loss that we don't talk about and that we think about as an if in our lives and the lives of our loved ones rather than a when. Um, and, and unconsciously, we all, I walk around with death as an if, not as a when, always. And so, so I wanted to become a death doula in order to develop the, well, to train as a death doula, in order to develop the kinds of skills and tools, and as Vanessa would say, medicine, to better hold people and situations of profound challenge and profound transformation, the difficult stuff that we don't wanna face, the stuff we don't wanna look at, the stuff that makes us incredibly uncomfortable to be in the same room as, the stuff that this world and particularly social media is making, is atrophizing as a, as a, as a, as a cognitive capability. We are no longer co cognitively capable of holding things in the way that our ancestors probably also recent ancestors were and clearly are. I mean, I see it in the generations of my grandparents. And so. How do we start to create spaces in which we can safely and with um, grace hold the unbearable, given the fact that the un unbearable staring down at us day in, day out through a million different reasons? And how do you develop skills that help you to do that with respon with responsibly. I don't hold space responsibly yet, but I hope, you know, this is one of the many ways in which one could. And I, you know, having experienced an enormous amount of toxicity um, in activist contexts, I wasn't going to go the route of like um, activism holding space. I think that there's like quite a lot of patriarchy left in activism, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it's a whole other story, but um, so, so this kind of quite, uh, I don't, feminine is not the word, but weaving reparative like way of working felt important. Um, and so to your second point, which had to do with repatriation, rematriation and, and, and language. It's really interesting because I'm as, uh, emerge from literature and therefore clearly language has an incredibly important uh, uh, sort of influence on me. And yet I have so little patience for um, discourse, debates and discourses that get stuck on semantics. And I know that language and terminology is like incredibly important in the legal sphere. And one of the things that I really appreciate as a difference between where I sit and where you, you sit as lawyers is you need to define all your terms before at the top of a piece of, of a piece of 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 paper. <laughs> I am playing with the ambiguity in the word 
ecology playing with a bunch of ambiguities sort of on purpose in a sense. So there's a kind of poetic drift that is allowed in the work that I do. Having said that, there is something really kind of weird and dangerous and scary that is happening, not perhaps in the legal context or in the poetic and art context, but in the field in between, where the, the sort of random bizarre appropriation of terms from one side or from side to side, the sort of ping pong of semantic debates that is the notion that an extreme right wing politician in the US could be talking about freedom of speech or that an anti-choice activist mm -hmm. in um, anywhere really could be talking about um, dignity or life, even life. The fact that those words mean so little once they can mean so much reminds me of an anthropologist's work. Called, he's Italian called Ernesto de Martino. He gave a beautiful lecture. It's a book that just came out in English translation. So you're lucky because you can re read it in English. I read it in Italian called La Fine del Mondo, The End of the World. And in one of the initial lectures, he says the end, a world, a world comes to an end when the signs of that world are no longer readable. Um, now, of course, when we think about sort of the Inca civilization, we interpret that statement as meaning you go and see an ancient Inca site and the signs and symbols and language that are inscribed in those ruins are no longer readable or interpretable. Therefore, that world has ended. But I think if we start to think about the way that language now is just these floating signifiers attached to nothing, floating around in the massively politicized debates, massively politicized and massively sort of technological mediated debates, I have an inkling that actually this is what it looks like when the signs of this world are becoming no longer readable. It doesn't look like from one day to the next you wake up and you can't read that piece of paper. It looks like nothing that meant means something means the same thing for everyone. It just they're just floating around. I keep when I, in my um, more grim days, I interpret the present as a world just full of floating signifiers signifying nothing rooted to nothing and so on this is like but i'm not that nihilist most of the time <laughs> what i do <laughs> however think is that in this moment which is clearly a moment of great transformation it's clearly the moment of the death of something what i'm i feel dedicated to is that allowing space for the wider metabolism to strengthen its tether to us which is essentially allowing space for something to birth and and Vanessa is also very keen on saying, you also have to accept that that thing that is birthing might not be birthing next to you or in your immediate environment or community, and that's fine. But to work on things that have, as you say, healing at heart, repair at heart. And for me, it's like, if you talk about repatriation or rematriation, repair, regeneration, restitution, repatriation, rematriation, have a connection to each other. And it's not just... Um, semantic connection it's it's a historical ontological connection and how do we start to understand that and really kind of dig into that monoculture and monoculture don't just have the same word monoculture and single culture don't just have the same word one of them talks about you know uh, plant plants and the other one talks about civilizations and cultures human cultures they they are they they you know, so, so here you have two schemas in a sense. This is all very new, it's very abstract and loose, but you've got two movements. One of them is the comp some terms are just floating around, have just completely separated from the earth and are just floating around, being reclaimed, claimed, signifying nothing as um, which poet would say? Uh, Shakespeare. Uh, <laughs> which poet? Oh, yeah, that guy. Um, on the other, you have a, the earth is joining language so clearly in the moment when the distinction between the metaphorical mm -hmm. and the literal collapse into each other. So monoculture and monoculture burn out and wildfires and then and, and the examples are millions. And what is that happening? That's the planet just hitting us in the face going, hey, you're part of the planet too. So all your symbols and metaphors that are abstract in your world 
look like this in the plant world and look like this in the ocean world, but it's all just one movement, right? Mm. And so it's, so, so lang like, as much as I get very tired of semantics conversation, <laughs> language is currently in like the stakes of it seem to be very active and boiling. And I think it's because we're at this end of the world mm -hmm. to conclude. <laughs> I think this is because we're at this kind of transition world moment. And so it becomes really interesting then, heartbreaking, of course, but also incredibly interesting to look at syn syncretic moments of syncretism in history and in the past and how to understand those, how to recognize those transitions in the kind of art and literature of and thought and et cetera, et cetera, and what's left from those specific kind of edge moments. Mm -hmm. That is so interesting. And um, I think that I, I actually continue to see a strand of healing. And um, and I don't know if we want to use the word repair because I, I think birthing of something different. And I really like the idea, it's hard to take, but that the birth might not be happening right next to us, but that we can be doing things to bring it about, which sounds really simplistic, but um, I see a strand of that in the continued making space for artists. Mm -hmm. I'm not even sure to call you a curator for me feels accurate. It's making space for actions and thinking and new ways of, or different or maybe regenerated ways of thinking. Um, I think, um, at this point, if anybody has any questions that they'd like to ask, and um, I would love for one of those questions to be, <laughs> to be. <laughs> <laughs> about um, Leach's work with more than human, more than human, excuse me. So I will open it up to the floor and particularly to any questions about more than human. <laughs> if anyone has a question. Or I can also do paleo. I would love to hear more. <laughs> <laughs> so we're just going to pretend that one of you asks the question, um, what do you mean by more than human? And how does your work relate to it? So very, very briefly, because I know that my, answer, my answers have been, been 15 minutes long each. Uh, uh, there's lots of terms to mean like multi-species, not just human, non-anthropocentric, and so on. More than human is one of them. I love it. Uh, it comes, I don't know who it comes from initially, but there's an amazing scholar called Maria Puig de la Bella Casa who wrote Matters of Care and then writes a lot about soil and composting as political strategy and so on. And she talks about more than human worlds. The notion that um, we exist within, depend on, are constituted of, and sort of thrive within a, a planetary system which includes humans and humans are not at the center of it though they they're doing an incredibly good job at wrecking everything else but and that looking at paradigms that don't put the human place the human necessarily at the center of epistemology um and there's probably a reason why that those paradigms emerge a lot from the worlds of like critical anthropology and that's simply because so many of the civilizations and cultures that had a vision of a, had and have a vision of a kind of vitalist um, distributed sense of consciousness, the vitalism you were talking about, talking to plants. I mean, sort of also rituals that allow you to sort of sense into the vitality and consciousness and intelligence of non-human beings and so on. So many of those cultures were sort of vastly devastated by empire um, in its different forms and are therefore like so, um, precarious um, and yet so strong right so enduring so 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 strong at the same time um, so a lot of this emerges from sort of critical anthropological writing um, although you know sort of scientific research the western scientific research has some of it has like caught on and there's some like renegade scientists that are looking at plant intelligence and um, fishes senses of self and things like this and 
So what Filipa Ramos and I wanted to do um, when we started to work together was to work on a research project and um, festival series and eventually podcast and publication project that um, didn't necessarily take anthropocentrism head on, but started to look at the implications of anthropocentrism, like what flows out of an anthropocentric notion of the world or a human exceptionalist notion of the world. And how can we start to unpick those things with the help of anthropologists, scientists, artists, da, 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 da. Um, and that's the shape of a circle in the mind of a fish that you've mentioned. And it's a series that I also love the title. It came up in um, a session with my psychotherapist. Uh, it comes from <laughs> it comes from the puffer fish, which is this tiny little fish. And if you've seen Blue Planet, you know that it sort of shuffles around for hours in the sand, creating this incredible sort of artwork of divots and mountains of sand in a perfectly circular uh, pattern with intricate details, and that it does so being a fish this small, creating something enormous. And so my great concern when one day at the therapist was what, surely we see it from the top with a camera of the BBC and whatever. And David Attenborough says that it's to attract a mate and all this stuff, we see it as a circle. But if the puffer fish is just doing this for hours, probably that circle actually appears in the fish's consciousness as a set of movement coordinates, so like a dance. So that in this kind of ambiguous translation space between human aesthetics, visual-led human aesthetics and fish-led choreographic, you know, encoding, something super interesting was happening. So the shape of a circle in the mind of a fish then has looked at lots of different things. The first edition was on interspecies communication and so sort of kind of unbuilding the notion that la you need language to communicate the second one was on um, Gaia theory interior multitude microbiological life inside us us as a kind of group of beings rather than a, you know what do we mean when we say I really um, swarm robotics as well because there were also we were concerned with more than human but also in its technological implications I suppose um, and a third was on plant consciousness, plant intelligence and sort of ways into that and through that. Uh, fourth was on soil and land and earth and ground. And so it had a very strong element of climate justice, that one, because if you say soil, it brings all the mycologists and all the rest of them. And if you say land, then there's a whole other set of coordinates that leads you, um, that leads you for onward. And so we really were keen on going like it's an event on soil, land, earth, ground and dust, you know, and so we could just really sort of make sure that it's not like the um, sort of social justice uh, kind of land rights project is sits over here and the mushroom person whoopsie daisy, sits, sits over there, you know, it's like it's, the, it's, the, that's the ground, it's there, like you grab it and it holds all of that. And that's a process that Anna Tsing calls and Elaine Gan calls taking seriously, which is you look at something and then you take it seriously enough for it to have microbiological, political, global, local, uh, sort of all of those aspects are sort of held in it, um, which is also a very Blakean poetic kind of way of thinking. So that's the more than human work. And we, we did a, a, we worked on a very big reader that has all kinds of um, writing from different disciplines. That came out in 2020, and I think it needs a second reader. So I'm compiling, actually, no, I'm compiling the funding possibilities for making that second reader. <laughs> the text will come later. Um, but the project just continues because it it's, that writing has um, multiplied rather than, yeah, since we started. That's really fascinating. <laughs> um, any other questions? Yes. First of all, thank you so much um, for this. This is much. Oh, sure. If that's okay for yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no worries. Um, thank you so much for um, doing this amazing talk this evening. I've learned so much in the span of like the last hour. I think my brain's slightly smoking. <laughs> Um, but I actually wanted to ask a little bit more about your position at the Serpentine because you said that you went from a more programming-based role, and I think that that's really interesting. But now you're in a more like senior management policy-based role. And um, 
just for context, I'm coming from not a law background. I work in the arts um, and I studied cultural policy. And so I wanted to understand a little bit more about your position and your priorities within the role and how you implement those within the organization as someone who's wanting to think about like making a future impact in the sector. Brilliant. Wow. Do you have three out? <laughs> <laughs> I have so much to share about that. Well, um, it's my main focus of work at the moment because I've only just started it. Um, so the idea with general ecology was, quote unquote, to embed environmental concerns and purpose within the whole of the organization's programs, infrastructures and network. Uh, it couldn't do that necessarily. Um, and then in parallel to that is happening something else, which is the sort of by and large debunking of carbon offsetting, sort of emissions based carbon offsetting uh, uh, strategies. It's not even a strategy. It's like um, yeah, excuses. And sort of by and large, that is uh, something that's been debunked. So it leaves a lot of organizations, governments, nations, cultural organizations, what have you, with a big question, which is, we made a net zero promise. How on earth do we fulfill a net zero promise without shutting down? So I think what's likely to emerge, now there is a net zero kind of commitment, even in the serpentine sustainability policy. I don't think that it would be we also just don't want to pull like a Tory party withdrawal from climate commitments at the Serpentine. We wouldn't want to do that. But in the background, what we're doing also is exploring the possibilities or prototyping rather a different method, which is the one that I've been working on for a few months, a different method for embedding uh, environmental sort of action uh, in a much more holistic, flexible, and adaptive way throughout everything that we do. So in very, very brief terms, what we've done is, uh, uh, well, go through all the documents that sort of lay out the basis of the Serpentine as an organization, the broad mission statements, the sustainability statement, the action plan that flows from that, um, the green team's kind of terms of reference, even like what the green team is there to do and how, um, built a three-year ecology strategy, a new document entirely, a new sort of policy, I suppose, entirely, that looks, that that kind of develops the suggestion for this particular prototype, and then are cascading everything else from there. Now, in the ecology strategy, there is a piece that basically says there are at least nine or 10 ways that an organization can become invested, that an organization's project or department can be invested in climate or environmental action at least, we'll expand those, of course. Reducing carbon and waste, influencing indirect carbon and waste, um, thought leadership and kind of awareness raising, platforming of advocacy projects and activist voices, systems change initiatives, um, you know, all that sort of stewarding and holding and transition, doula companionship uh, systems. There's a few more that I'm forgetting. And essentially it goes, those are, we are laying out all the aims and we will work methodically to work out a protocol with every department, with every exhibition, with every project that looks at those aims and goes, what is realistically achievable of all of this in this thing? And if we're weak on that, can we be strong on something else? Oh, sorry, infrastructure building for the sector, you know, creating new networks and materials sharing and all this kind of stuff. There's a lot. And so now what we're doing with a green team is the green team is tasked to kind of go bit by bit by bit and go, these are all the options. What can we realistically achieve? That's the prototype. That's the, that's the, that's the wager that I'm putting on. It's where I put my reputation on the line. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, I hope to be the first person to admit that it doesn't. Um, the, the, other thing that I've been doing, just I'm sharing it just for the fun of it, because I think it's important. And it's funny how a lot of the work that I'm doing is now much less public than it used to be. The other work that I'm doing is, I think that an organization, because I'm really invested in organizational ecologies and organizational management theory. And so the other thing that I've been doing is think from an organizational ecology standpoint of how beyond kind of sustainability obligations, how do we develop a soul around this as a staff body? And so I've been uh, developing a series of artist-led workshop-based programs for staff only that look at decolonial botany, 
sort of methodologies for connecting to the earth and the history of the ground beneath us for, you know, tabletop role playing games for staff to kind of think about environmental speculative environmental futures and things like this. Those are, that's the avenues that we're kind of looking at the moment for the next year. Then there's a kind of symbiotic strategic set of choices that you make. So if you bring an artist to do a staff only workshop, how do you kind of build public programmings and activations in such a way that you don't have to bring them over twice? So there's probably likely to be the sort of internal work and the external work at the same time. Then we're building on, to on top or underneath a layer of evaluation and sort of research so that there's, at the moment, there will be a kind of researcher that follows the things that we do and then eventually kind of evaluates them. And then as we're doing that, we're also trying to build a layer underneath, which looks at, well, what are the methods of impact assessment that exist at the moment in the sector and how can we make them better? So that's a, it's simultaneously a long answer, but also a very abridged answer. But thank you for that question because it's the kind of stuff that gets me also very excited. <laughs> um, how are we doing on time? I think we're over time. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I hate to say that. Um, so we probably should wrap up because uh, yeah. we should let everybody have an opportunity to have a drink and to continue this conversation.